Thanks. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, as James stated, um, I practice in Janesville, and I'm a solo attorney, and I have uh, two full-time staff members, and I have two sort of contract attorneys that I work with. So I'm a I'm a small small outfit. Um, been practicing since 1988, and so and I do I practice in several areas of the law. I'm sort of your kind of jack of all trades, uh, one of those rare attorneys that kind of like a small hometown attorney. Uh, one of the areas that I do, like like a lot of folks, is I do wills. And uh, I first heard about this Wisconsin Digital Property Act maybe six months ago. And I, I was like, geez, I, I don't hear anything more about this. And I thought, boy, this is something that, that uh, we, we really got to be aware of. Everybody's going to need to revise their will forms and their power of attorney forms for their clients. And this is just something that that's, the word's not getting out there uh, for folks. So, um, so I, this is, that's why I chose this as a topic. Um, now, before we go forward, I want to go back in time a little bit. And I'm going to go back to 1988. Don't worry, Rod, I'm not going to send a laser or anything here. But back, so this is our time machine. And we're going back in 1988. I graduated from law school in 1988. Back then I had hair. I had a mullet back then. Anybody have a mullet in here? No, nobody's going to admit it. Yeah, there you go. You know, business in the front, party in the back, Kentucky, Kentucky waterfall, you know, all of those things. Um, so we're going back to 1988. The practice of law was quite different then. So if you are a recent graduate in out of law school in 1988, what are what's your first order of business when you're going to get relatives that come to you and friends that want to give you business and they say, Scott, do a will for me. Everybody wants to help you when you start out. So my first year, I do 50 wills, right? Second year comes around, all of a sudden I'm doing five probates because five of those people died, right? Um, I worked in a law firm that had a what we call a will vault then. So back in the day, lawyers would keep the original wills. I don't know if any of you guys remember this, but the lawyers would keep the original will after you did someone's will. And there was usually a big safe in the basement. And I remember going down in this basement, I see all of these wills in there. And that would be a lawyer's book of business in the future because when these folks passed, they would probably come to your law firm to try to do the probate because you had the will. So they'd say, I'm going to go into that office and it sort of, it was a, a way to get business. Now that, that practice is outlawed. Uh, but anyway, that's the way it was. So back in the day, you would go in there and all of these wills would be lined up in, in these stacks in there. And the wills were all in fancy envelopes. Some of the older ones, they were sealed with wax, and they had like a signet ring or something that they put in there, it looked like. There's this fancy seal with a wax on them. They were all in, stacked in order in the old days. Um, they, in the wills in those days, they were fancy because at that time, there was, there was, you'd, you'd have to retype them. There was no computers. Um, you'd have um, even carbon paper, you, you know, is, was a, the thing that we were using at that time. And you would have backers on the wills. So the wills would have these fancy things, the paper uh, stapled over, and a lot of times a different color backer. So the, everything was different back in that time before computers. And that's how attorneys would keep their book of business going. And, if you, and a lawyer, when they retired, they would still have all these will vaults and things uh, where if someone took over that, that law firm, they would, they would get this as their book of business. So things were a lot different back in that day. Um, now, um, also back in that day when, when uh, someone came to you for the probate and you are the lawyer that did the will, 
you, let's just say somebody's brother died and they came into your office and they said, all right, Scott, what do we got to do to get this probate started? What should I do? And I would say, okay, you go to the trusty old gray file cabinet in your brother's house and all you had to do is get all of the papers. So you get the bank statements, you get the person's, um, all of their paperwork for their final bills. Um, everything was stored right in the trusty gray file, file cabinet that everybody had in their basement with their important papers. Or maybe a safe deposit box. But that person would bring those things to your office and you'd have all the papers and things that you need. So this was back in 1988. That's the way we did things. Well, things are a lot different today. High tech. A lot different today. That's my prop, by the way, my prime time machine prop there. A lot different today. So today, you have to worry about a lot more things than the old gray file cabinet where the person's important papers are. You still have to get their important papers, but there are a lot more things to worry about things that we call digital assets. And everyone is going to have to adapt in their practice now to deal with these digital assets. So what, what do we mean by digital assets? One of the handouts that I provided to you, um, let me just grab it here. Looks like this, and there's a whole bunch of examples of digital assets. So what is the problem that we're facing today when someone comes in either to draft a will, if we're planning ahead, or after somebody passes? You have problems with how do you get in their phone or their computer? If, you're, if someone is a personal representative and they have to get things off your computer, how do they do that? How are you gonna find out somebody's computer password? That's a problem. Um, what about online accounts? So for example, a lot of people, you get a, a paperless um, statement. You don't, you don't get the bank statement anymore. It's not gonna be in the trusty old gray file cabinet. It's gonna be digital. So if you're the personal rep and you gotta find the guy's bank accounts and what the account numbers are and all that so you can do the probate, how are you gonna get into that? What's the password and what's the username to get into those bank accounts? Um, a problem now is Facebook. Everybody has Facebook. Everybody has all kinds of pictures on Facebook or other social media. Um, and this is going to be even more of a big deal um, as, as the younger generation gets older and older and they start passing. What's going to happen when all of these pictures are on Facebook and the family wants to get into Facebook uh, for pictures for the funeral? You know, how are... How are you going to deal with that? And if somebody comes into your office and says, hey, we need to get somebody to get into Facebook to do that, how are you going to get somebody's username and password? Each one of these social media things has different rules, different regulations on how to get into these. So if you do planning ahead of time, you, you as an estate planning attorney should be able to get this information to ahead of time from your client or know how to get into these things. And that's what this digital act is envisioning is as lawyers, we are going to be able to, to get the keys to the person's digital world, these usernames and passwords, and somehow get them to the personal rep. Um, other examples of problems that people have, what about if your business has a blog and a has digital a website and things like that. Some businesses, if someone isn't posting on there constantly, if it that 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 will lose assets. So let's say if someone has paid all kinds of money, um, let's say Rob has spent all kinds of money to get up to number one for um, Janesville corporate attorneys through search engine optimization by having these blogs and all of this content going all the time on his, his website, and then all of a sudden he passes, and all of a sudden there's no post going on, all of a sudden that's going to drop down. That could mean his business is worth less money. So somebody has to get access to these passwords and usernames in order to do that. So you can kind of see the, the problems involved. The problem is 
how does how do we get that and how can we as estate planners plan ahead for this problem and it's a big problem so I think everybody sees the what the problem is um, at this point in time um, and I, I want to talk about some of the solutions one also before I leave the problem the Supreme Court rule and I want to cite the right number but it's 1.1 is competence all lawyers are deemed to handle their clients matters with competence and now as lawyers with, with this Digital Property Act and this problem we have to be competent in handling this we're really good at keeping clients secrets confidential information and this is something that we can do but it's something that we have to start doing with the digital world now we have to we have to get up to date on this update our files and start thinking about this as we're doing estate planning for our clients and and in order to competently represent our clients we have to do some planning okay so let's talk about some of the solutions to the problem I did in your um, in your packet I did um, provide a copy of chapter 711 the new digital property act this digital property act is going to govern a lot of different areas of practice um, digital property is going to be dealt with in in wills in trusts in probate in guardianships all of these different areas of the law are going to have to deal with digital property and this this act um, gives definitions of what what are digital property what is digital property and how it's affected in these different topics I'm just taking on today with my short topic is is just to try to give you um, samples and give you ideas on it, dealing with wills and power of attorney financials you know the, the most common things that we deal with but if you practice in some of these other areas you're going to have to um, tailor this digital property act to be in compliance you're going to have to tailor your forms and your practice for that as well and then I also have another printout with the I'm calling them ancillary statutes or other statutes that deal with digital property and that's 244.445 and 244.41 um, and these talk about digital property in, in specific um, circumstances including um, the power of attorney financial so um, I provided these statutes for you you can review these on your own time and you're going to want to uh, really get up to date on these I also uh, provided um, an article that was in the Wisconsin lawyer magazine and this is how I first became aware of this new digital property act and the author is this, is Ken Barzak and um, Ken was on the committee uh, by Governor Walker to address the Digital Property Act. So he was on the committee that made the recommendations to the legislature to enact this, um, this Digital Property Act. And this article gives a real good legislative history on um, how this, pro how, what the problem is it's trying to address, um, how the legislature tackled it and how it became a law and it also tried to make it in conformance with the federal law there's also a, a federal law that um, deals with this and a federal commission that was set up as well so this article is is really a good starting point when you delve into the digital property act to get to become aware of it and to adapt this to your practice um, so one of the solutions to this problem of dealing with digital property is first part is to make yourself aware of the new Wisconsin law which um, has addressed this problem um, another uh, way to solve this problem or look at this is there's different storage solutions that you can um, you have to think about how you're going to run your practice and what your best practice is going to be for estate planning so um, I had mentioned before the idea of confidentiality I can see some ethical problems that are going to arise with this new digital property act and I can see some things as a practical matter that are going to infringe on 
Um, our duty to our client when they come in and they do their will and they do their estate plan and they're giving us all of their confidential information. They're literally giving us information that could lead to somebody getting the keys to their financial kingdom with the um, passwords and uh, to their bank statements and things like that and the usernames. Um, but what are you going to do? So you have a duty to, for confidentiality. You are the trusted keeper of a person's secrets. I always told my kids when they, would, when they were younger, they would ask me about some, somebody they had heard that I was representing or something, and I'd always say, I'd tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. <laughs> and after a while, they kind of got the idea, don't ask me about any, about any cases, or I can't tell you anything anyway. But the idea behind that is, as an attorney, you have an absolute duty to keep your clients' um, information confidential. So when someone comes in and does an estate plan with you and they explain all of these things, you have a duty of confidentiality. The point is that when that person passes, you're going to have different people coming to you, pushing and pulling on you to try to get passwords, usernames, those kind of things perhaps. Like I mentioned, they might need to try to get pictures for Facebook for the funeral. So you're going to have a real hard decision to make when somebody comes up to you and say, hey, says, hey, I'm so-and-so, this is how I'm related to the deceased, and I need to get into this account or that account. What are you going to do? Because some, you might have a will, and it says that somebody is a personal representative, but what if, what if another lawyer drafted a will after yours? <laughs> you don't, until the court appoints somebody as personal representative, who really has the authority to this. So if you give this information to the wrong person, you've breached your duty of confidentiality. So this is a big problem. Until somebody is appointed as personal rep by the court, you can't really do anything. I don't see a solution to this problem. Um, but you can, there are some ideas that you can to make um, to make it easier for you as an attorney and also make it easier once someone is appointed as personal representative. So there are different solutions as far as storing the passwords now we're talking about in user words. How are we going to deal with that? Well, one way of dealing with that is, let's say, the old gray file cabinet that we've had that's helped us all the time throughout the years. You could have your client have all of that information in the gray file cabinet and it's under a lock and key and let's say the client um, tells you you know here's where this lock and key is and my or tells the personal rep the appropriate personal rep where that is and then that's sort of out of your hands in other words there's a list of passwords and usernames in the file cabinet now it assumes that the the person who passed it assumes that that person has kept those up to date and everything too, but it would be a good starting point. So that's one way of handling it, is dealing uh, with the, the uh, file cabinet, using that as a tool to deal with that, um, that situation. Um, another thing is a letter of instruction. So you could have your client do a letter of instruction. We're, we're sort of familiar with this. Um, in fact, our wills allow clients to make a list of personal property as long as it's you know, not a bank account or something. And as long as they sign and date it, we don't have to do addendums to wills anymore. That person could say, my antique sewing machine goes to so-and-so and my niece gets my, uh, my wedding ring and that kind of thing. They can add that addendum. Well, you can have a letter of instruction that the client drafts up and that gets put right into the will. So that, that's another uh, possible um, storage solution for this. Um, another possible storage solution, solution for this, and I have it on your handout here, is their apps, okay? There's an app for that. So technology is going to come in and save us from this problem that we have with technology. But I just put um, three examples of apps. Um, these are password managers. So in essence, you could have, in, in their will, you could indicate the key, the pa username and password to get into my password manager is this, and that could be something. And so instead of the attorney 
keeping all of the passwords and usernames or um, having them in the, in the file cabinet, it's only one username and password, password that needs to be um, kept. Um, this is sort of the key to the kingdom, but then it's up to the client or the person that you're doing the will for to keep these up to date and all you're, they're really doing is telling you how to get into their password manager. There's a couple examples of those with it, the prices and things like that. Um, so one of them, it says you can provide an attorney with a password for access later. So the second one, um, the attorney would have a separate um, phone, no phone number to call into and a password that, that the attorney would have that would be different than your, your master password that the person would have. And then another one, just a sort of almost a low-tech one, is in your cell phone, um, evidently, <laughs> there's a thing called notes in there, and you can, all you really need to do to get this would be to put in the, pers the password to get on their cell phone, the numbers to key in, and then in their notes, they could put in there what the uh, password is for their password manager, and that would be another way uh, to, to solve that problem of how are you going to get to the passwords and the usernames. So, um, so th those are a couple of problems or solutions to the problem of how do we deal with these di digital assets. And then um, finally, the other part of your handout that I provided you um, is suggested language for your wills and your power of attorney documents. And this was, um, these are ones that I got from off the internet and I'm tweaking these somewhat myself. So like most of these things, you're, gonna, you're probably gonna wanna do a combination of taking um, several samples and, and uh, reviewing the statutes yourself and, and do your own research and then decide. But um, for each, the will language, I gave two examples of sort of a long version and a shorter version of the language that you would put into your wills to uh, give the personal representative the power under this Digital Property Act in order to get uh, deal with digital, uh, digital assets. And then the second page is the same thing for a power of attorney document. So these would be um, referencing the statute, uh, the statutory language that you need on your power of attorney financial in order to, um, in fact, give the power of attorney agent while the person is alive um, the same authority as the personal rep would have when that person passes. So the, these are the, um, the language that I'm suggesting that would, uh, each person has to go ahead and get their own individual uh, forms, but these are this is the type of language that you're going to need to develop in your forms to get up to date. So, um, in conclusion, then uh, the moral of the story is that we all have to deal with digital assets. Um, you don't want to be that guy from 1988 still sporting a mullet. You want to be up to date on these things, and you do not neglect your digital assets. You need to get on top of this. And this is something that we all need to modify our forms for. So now, do I have any questions? I know I've gone through a lot of material and a lot of topics, but is there any questions or concerns um, that anyone has? Or even comments? Yes, John. Uh, I suppose I'd start with the, the problem you raised at the very beginning with regard to not knowing if another will has been drafted. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that prevent you from handing out the password information under that same basis? You don't know if you're handing it to the right person uh, until uh, probate is commenced. It's Correct. That's right. My, my point is, until someone has authority, you can't turn the keys to the kingdom over. So, right. But in your will, in the wills that I'm, I'm drafting now, I'm having all of that language. If you don't have that language in your wills, then your personal rep doesn't have authority to deal with this digital stuff. That's the problem, you know. Even if the personal representative has a general license to handle the entirety of the estate? 
Right. I think if you go with that type of thing to Facebook or to a bank or something, they're not gonna they're not gonna do that. I in fact I had somebody call today. Um, someone had a, just a power attorney general, okay, a power attorney financial, just a general form, and they said that they've tried to go to the bank with that because their brother was in, incapacitated. They tried to go to the bank with that, and they said you it doesn't say in here that um, you get you can move the safe deposit box to a different bank. It doesn't specifically say that in there, so we're not going to honor that. And then I'd say, you, you know, you need to check with you, the attorney for the bank. This, is a, this has the, these general powers. But to comply with the Wisconsin Digital Property Act, um, all the authority, obviously there's no cases on this or anything, but all the authorities are saying you need to modify your wills to specifically comply with this statute. So anybody else see how the, there could be mischief with well, these? Yeah, there's another problem. Waiting for um, the probate court to appoint a personal rep. A lot of wills are not probated these days. Right. Right. So then, then what do you do? You better be damn sure that yours is the real will. Right. Right. So it's it's a problem. It's a problem that you know that we. I'm, that's why you know I'm citing the rules of ethics for that. It's like, boy, you know, this is going to be a problem that has to get addressed. But. You as an attorney are going to have to deal with that, either um, you know telling the I don't know I don't know if you have a a release form or something that the person you know non disclosure something that the proposed personal rep is going to sign if they get any information they won't disclose it to somebody else or I don't know, but it's a problem it's a big problem, so anything else. Your client can uh, waive confidentiality. They can authorize you to answer a question with, with, without, no, you know, without knowing uh, anything more than that. In other words, if I die and somebody approaches you the day afterwards and they're on my short list of people I trust, you can give that information to them. That'd be one way around that. But yeah, um, and that that would totally separate from the will. And mm -hmm. the observation I make is that. Uh, from the time that a person dies until a personal representative is is uh, appointed, uh, the letters are issued. Um, the funeral's usually over. Right. The the need to look at pictures is in the past. So yeah, there there always is going to be that exigency at the beginning. Mm hmm. Yeah, and it's kind of the same situation as we have now, you know. Yeah. And but. Uh, People are going to want to get, there's so many photos and stuff stored and things like that. I can just see f family and relatives, you know, um, even litigating over who, who gets the right to go in and get everything out of their Facebook and who doesn't. And, you know, that all the pictures and videos and all of that stuff, that, that could be a big issue for people. You know, for a lot of people, your whole life is your social media on there. That, you know, so... I have one other comment, and I'd just like your response mm -hmm. to it, and that is when you, when you look at, at, the, at the new law, uh, there are like three or four players that, they, that, that a custodian can demand a court order for. They're going to. <laughs> mm -hmm. They'd be silly not to. They're opening themselves up to liability and claims and criticism if they don't. And this is a new law. It seems to me we can expect that development as we go down the road. So might as well power up for that too, or getting your court orders right away. You know? Absolutely, and, and I'm, I'm sure everybody's tried to get phone records from whatever company, and they they won't turn them over. You got to have some special subpoena from some council in whatever state or something. They they go to great pains to make sure that you can't get uh, phone records or texts, and and I can see these different entities that are holding this information going to great links to not, they're, they're afraid to wrongfully disclose it to the person who doesn't have authority as well. So. If they, if they got the court order, they're, they're behind his cover. Though, right. You know, like, so they're going to they're gonna want that. Right. Correct. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you very much.